and the right. camera's looking at. Mm. Uh, this is a broadcasting history interview, uh, which we're doing uh, in uh, June of uh, 2005 with uh, George Carpenter, who uh, managed uh, WHO uh, radio and television in his mm -hmm. career. Uh, also was the executive director of the Iowa Public Television Network. Uh, so uh, you've uh, worn uh, some two pretty large hats there, George. <clears throat> no, very interesting mm -hmm. ones. Looking at it from two different, very different mm -hmm, perspectives. Mm -hmm. Well, as we go through our conversation today, I'd, I'd like to go back and, and begin with your uh, education and um, your military experience, which has a bearing on uh, how you got into this crazy business yes, of it broadcasting. Did. It, it really did, mm. yes. And you, where'd you go to school? Uh, in college, I went to uh, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and I, I uh, went through the NROTC program, okay. which had just started up after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I started there in 1946 and graduated uh, with a commission as an ensign in the Navy um, just about two weeks before the North Koreans decided to go south. Uh -huh. So when I reported to my, my destroyer, uh, things were getting very active. Uh, a lot of the uh, regular ship's officers were being sent off uh, to new ships that were coming out, and a lot of reservists from World War II were being called back. Uh, and one of them Grant was a fellow uh, who was our executive officer, lieutenant commander, uh, Ron Wheeler from, from mm -hmm. Oklahoma. And Ron and another friend of his uh, had started a radio station just after World War II in Oklahoma. And he was, uh, he was a mentor to me and talked a lot about radio, mm -hmm. encouraged me to, mm -hmm. uh, to look into that field. Mm -hmm. And sometime later, I, I, had, tr I had volunteered, uh, not knowing what I was getting into, to do some special assignment with the, uh, with the Marines and ended up uh, in North Korea with, with an attachment of um, American Marines and, uh, and uh, South Korean Marines. And when I got back, I was in Hawaii and uh, was dating a young lady, a captain's daughter, who worked at uh, the CBS radio and television station, KGMB. In Honolulu. In Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, through her, I got to meet and know a lot of the people um, in that business, mm -hmm. enjoyed them, and as a matter of fact, uh, had been offered a job on their, their radio station uh, when I was about to get out. Mm -hmm. But at the time, uh, she kind of went with the, uh, with the arrangement, and I wasn't quite ready for that. Delightful young lady, but I just wasn't quite ready. Went home, I had the uh, GI Bill, and had uh, planned to go, go on to um, uh, business school at the University of Michigan. But I came down with malaria that I had picked up um, in, in North Korea. As it turned out, did all of my attachment all had, uh, had the same problem. So I was out of business for a while and didn't want to wait another year, and I really wasn't that dedicated to it. And I wanted to get started, and television business was new, uh, and so I decided to pursue that. So you were at a point as you got through with your military service when uh, Television, these television stations were just coming on mm -hmm. the air, really. Actually, night. there was a freeze. Yeah. Uh, the, the one I ended up with in Omaha had uh, been signed on prior to the freeze in, in 49. But WHO here, for example, was uh, d couldn't go on until 54. Mm -hmm. So you, um, as I recall, you had an <coughs> opportunity to get into a trainee programming with them uh, at WW TV. Well, I did. I, I had uh, gone around the country uh, one kind of seen old college and Navy friends been knocking on doors at television stations trying to get it started and uh, kept running into the uh, problem as we all do when we start out, you know, what's your experience? Yeah. And uh, uh, of course I, I had none, uh, but they said, well, did you major in drama or were you an English major in college and things that they thought might apply to the uh, television business? Well, I was an economics major and that made at that time, <laughs> that made no sense in television. They, they weren't, didn't care about that. Uh, so I, I came back home to Des Moines and uh, some people said, well, you know, Meredith has, has uh, four stations. And I went down and, and talked to uh, Ed Meredith and Fred Bowen and Payson Hall, who was the head of their uh, broadcast, and finally uh, Harold Stalnecker, who was uh, his assistant, uh, took an interest and he arranged interviews for me with their, uh, their station heads and Frank Fogarty in Omaha uh, at the time was 
uh, looking for, he was going to do a trainee job that like NDC had, and he mm -hmm. was going to hire some ninny, you know, off the street that didn't know anything about it, and put them through six months of, of uh, working in each department. Mm -hmm. And if something turned up fine, it was a take, why, uh, you know, they had the job if you wanted it, and if not, why, you know, you start it over again. So you went, uh, you, you actually began your career then on the, uh, on the sales, on the business side. Well, actually, the, the trainee job, it was, it was just fascinating. It's too bad everybody can't have that because sure. I worked uh, in the news department. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I worked uh, uh, in, in the uh, film department, uh, uh, worked in, in sales, uh, did everything I could not. They wouldn't let me in the accounting department, but that <laughs> probably didn't make any sense for me either. Uh, but in engineering, and, and there was a good, broad background, a lot of, a lot of production work, a lot of work on the floor, mm -hmm. um, uh, moving the lights around and the, yeah. the mic boom and, and all. And eventually then you were hired. Went into sales. There was went no into sales, sales as an account yes. executive at WWTV, yeah. Yeah. Right. which was a television station that was uh, organized um, by a company that owned a very uh, important early radio station, WOW Radio. That's right, that's right. And the name that, that you, Frank Fogarty, that you mentioned was, a, I think, was considered a legendary manager, wasn't he? He wasn't. He had just taken over from, from somebody also, uh, Johnny Gillen, hmm. uh, who was truly legendary, uh, who died in his early 40s mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, at the desk. He, he was a very active fellow. Mm -hmm. Great stories about him. But Frank was certainly a, one of those fine gentlemen and uh, was very kind and helpful to me. Mm -hmm. And on that... Um, well, at that time, the, the television station had a personality by the name of Ray Clark on That's right. doing yes. news, Ray who doing had, news. Uh, I remember from my boyhood experience in Nebraska as a very, very excellent radio newscaster. He was excellent, had a, had a marvelous presence, and he uh, uh, had a wonderful willpower because at the time when I was working uh, in production in the floor, uh, and this is before videotape. Everything was live then. All the commercials right. were live and everything. And we used to uh, do everything possible to break Ray up, and and uh, <laughs> you know, including you know, giving him a hot foot, uh, <laughs> which the camera would be above. They couldn't see we were doing. When we that. used to and, do things like that, <laughs> and, and and you know, moving his script around. Mm -hmm. And but he was just solid as a rock. Yeah. Never broke. He had a lot of cockpit time <laughs> yes, he did. behind yes, he him, did. didn't he? Well, he certainly was a great professional mm -hmm. in, the, in the early days. Uh, you also ran across a guy named Dave Shea over there. Dave was, Dave was in our news department. Um, Dave had, was uh, uh, very highly thought of, and uh, he was also an outstanding golfer mm -hmm. and uh, gave me lots of lessons and took some of my money on the uh, local <laughs> Omaha. Links. So you played, uh, played uh, <coughs> golf with Dave, when, mm -hmm. and by that time you were an account executive and he was in the news department. That's right. And he and moved I, from there then, of course, to WMT-TV yes, Channel 2 and, and retired from mm -hmm. that station. Mm -hmm. So, and a very, very fine gentleman. Mm -hmm. Well, you did, um, you did obviously uh, very well um, uh, in sales, and um, they moved you into a, a sales, a more sa responsible position in sales department? Well, uh, I, I became the, the regional sales manager. Okay. Um, which... Uh, Meant I handled Minnesota and I handled uh, St. Louis, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Kansas But that City. was a step up the ladder. In it was the, a step up and, a, and kind of broadening in, in my experience. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, during that time, I had kind of a fun experience, Grant. Uh, uh, I set up, or we set up really kind of a, a hoc, ad hoc uh, rep business. Okay. Uh, where uh, I knew what was going on in Omaha. Uh, Harold Heath, uh, who was WC in, in uh, Davenport. Right had a good feel for that market. Uh, George Dorrington, who was at WMT, mm -hmm. uh, would let us know what was going on, on up there. And then somebody, I, I can't remember the name, but somebody at KCCI or KRNT at the time uh, had Des Moines. So we would kind of change information and let each other know, you know what was happening in, in each person's market. And if there was something hot, why we you know, run over that market and try and get some business for our station. And so you were exchanging uh, uh, sales potential yeah. information yeah. with your uh, I knew counterparts a client, in these non I knew a client stations. in Omaha was about to break loose with some money that uh, could be maybe go to Cedar Rapids or Davenport or mm -hmm. Des Moines. Where I'd, I'd give them a call. Well, that was pretty ingenious uh, well, thing to yeah, do. It, but it, as it you say, out, that developed into well. the station rep business That's right. then, That's where right. companies were organized yeah. to do exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That then uh, got you um, a job in the Cedar Rapids uh, Waterloo market at KCRG. Well, I, yeah, it, it did. I, I uh, wanted to be a sales manager. Um, one of the reasons, because the sales manager we had had uh, sales meetings at 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and I've never been an early morning person. I, I, I could get there on time, and I kind of knew my name, but that was about it. So I wanted to be a sales manager and have meetings at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when I was, I could really have been charged them. then. Okay. Uh, but there wasn't an opportunity or didn't, I didn't see one coming up uh, there or at the other Merida stations. And uh, uh, Red Gardner, who was at the manager of KCRG, called me and, and offered me a position, which, uh, which I almost didn't get the offer because Katie and I, my wife and I, drove over there to... Uh, to look at the station mm -hmm. and to meet him. And the address, I understood, was 1st Street South and 1st um, Avenue East or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And I drove around through all those locations, and I couldn't see a radio and television station. <laughs> you could. <laughs> and I was going back and across the bridges and whatever. And finally, I uh, went to a gas station mm -hmm. at the original address and said, you know, I'm obviously lost. I'm looking for a radio and television station, KCRG. And he said, well, it's up there. And here was a business building that had H&R Block and an insurance company right. and some other they stuff They were up on the it. second floor. Uh, and they were <coughs> on the second floor. And I turned to my wife and said, no, this is silly. This, you know, this isn't going to work. She said, well, we're here. Now you really ought to go talk to them. Well, I did, and I'm delighted. <laughs> right. Because that turned out to be um, just a really great experience. Uh, and, yes, it was an obstacle uh, doing car commercials because you couldn't put <laughs> cars up, up in the studio. <clears throat> but we found some kind of ingenious ways of uh, getting around that. Sure. And, and it, was, uh, it was started in a, in a very modest way in mm -hmm. that business building on the west side of the river. And, yeah. of course, they later moved to a wonderful facility. Yes, that was right? after, after I had gone. After you left. Uh, but you, you came to that station at a time when they were sort of coming alive from a very uh, sleepy period, sleepy beginning, I think. I don't mm -hmm. think the Gazette Company thought that television was very important in the in the early days. Well, or I think they or felt maybe it was very it. important yeah. and didn't want anybody else to uh, to have it, which I, I can well understand yeah. that. Because, <clears throat> but Red Red was a, a very vital guy, mm -hmm. uh, and and he was a doer. Uh, one of the things I learned though right away, Grant, and I, I guess I was somewhat aware of what a powerhouse WMT was. Uh, but shortly after I arrived, I was in a, um, invited to be in a breakfast club, and I met a fellow who ran a, um, a kitchen, retail kitchen uh, business, and he had the, all the cabinets, and he had the uh, appliances, whatever, and was going to have an open house, and I talked him into putting all of his advertising dollars on, on uh, KCRG television, which he did. Mm -hmm. But I said, please, you know, as people come in, have them sign their name, and where they heard the advertising. 75% of them said they'd seen it on WMT television. Something like 15% had heard it on WMT radio. No, they, there, there was no radio. And the rest, I think, said they saw it on, on uh, KCRG. I mean, it was really overwhelming what a reputation that You were that, really uh, taking on a, that a giant, had, weren't you? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Very impressive group there, though. I, I, they're, they're, at KCRG, it's a good... Good group of broadcasters. Edna Herbs. <coughs> Edna was Edna was our promotion manager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who would have the who would have the news uh, people been at that time then, George? They were they started. Well, I uh, think they made a beginning on a really making a commitment to news in that period of time. Yeah, and it, the uh, the anchor uh, Bob Henry. Bob Henry. Bob, okay. who, who was very good. As yeah. a matter of fact, uh, he followed me down to uh, WHO. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can't remember the name of the news director at that time. That's, that's, I'm sorry about that. But, no, that yeah. but my responsibilities were, were basically just uh, sales. Sales, of yeah. course. So you chipped away at that 75% uh, <laughs> <laughs> of the Channel 2 dominance. And it was a but, tough job, wasn't it? Yeah, well, but, it, but again, it was fun because you know, television was new. Uh, the station, as you pointed out earlier, uh, had no place to go but up. Yeah. And you could try all sorts of things. Uh, you know, and maybe a little of it worked, a lot of it didn't, but it was, uh, you had a chance to try it. Right. And you had, it certainly was a good test of your 
sales managerial skills because you were you had about as tough a job as anybody was going to ever get to take on that uh, Channel Two juggernaut. Well, I, yeah, I, it was, and, and you know, my first assignment was uh, the sales department. They had it all left when they found out I was hired because they all wanted the job, <laughs> and they had gone uh, elsewhere. So mm -hmm. I had to start you know, putting together had a, to recruit a team, uh, a sales team. Mm -hmm. So how long were you there? I was in Cedar Rapids for four years. Mm -hmm. And then um, um, Bob Harder, who had been sales manager at the WHO stations, uh, called, and I had known Bob kind of through through the, the business. Uh, he had been promoted to um, a general manager mm -hmm. at, at the WHO stations, and and was looking for a television station manager mm -hmm. or sales manager, mm -hmm. which which uh, then I came down and, and took over that assignment. So you took over the Channel 13 mm -hmm. uh, K WHO television right. station. Right sales management yeah, responsibility. Yeah. Uh, still a pretty tough market. <clears throat> oh, ran into another powerhouse <laughs> with, with uh, Karen T, um, and it may have been KCCI by that time, Yeah, uh, who had done a very fine job, uh, particularly in the news area, yeah. which was, which was you know, becoming more of a challenge at the time to, yeah. to, uh, to get your reputation by, by having the dominant news. And television was becoming much more important. It mm -hmm. was becoming by this time, it, you, you're entering the 60s, are you? This was 64. That uh, was right in the middle of the decade where television became the dominant medium for news. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which I couldn't tell my, my radio brethren that at WHO. No, of because, course not. Uh, they still felt you know, it was kind of a Johnny-come-lately that uh, yeah. um, if God meant pictures to fly, he would have uh, given them wings. It was but it was, it, it was, uh, Interesting in, in watching the news, uh, Russ Van Dyke was, was uh, the news director, or, or on air and, uh, talent, and I guess and news director too. And news it? director, right. At, at eight, and uh, uh, he had a very, very strong following. Yeah. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, we tried to get him jobs all over the country. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, nobody was interested. In any other market, he might not have done as well. I think that's the case. But I think... What, what happened, my kind of analysis of, of why it was, but WHO Radio and Karen Tier Radio had both had very good reputations. Um, Jack Shelley, who was our news director and had been the principal on-air uh, news person at, at uh, WHO Radio. Yes. When television <laughs> came about, uh, Jack took over the, uh, the 6 o'clock news, which in radio had been, that was, you know, principal newscast. Mm -hmm. Uh, various people came and went in the 10 o'clock news, uh, including, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Jim Zobel did a stint for right. a while as, yeah. as the uh, anchor in news. Uh, KCCI, Karen T, very smartly put uh, uh, Van no. Dyke in, in that 10 o'clock spot, right. and he owned it. And they, he, they did it early on, mm -hmm. too. Be That's right, from when they started. When they, and they got on, a, I think, a... No, no. Actually, I guess HO got on the air first. Didn't they, it? HO got on the air because Karen T mm -hmm. and KSO were having a battle right. over uh, uh, who would get the license. And the big uh, mistake that uh, that Palmer made was not giving uh, Shelley that that dominant newscast at ten o'clock. I've heard I, other people say. I think Jack I, says that. Yeah, I I think <coughs> very much so. There <coughs> there was another <coughs> factor too, uh, which which made quite a difference, uh, which I was not aware of early until I got there. But uh, our, our tower was uh, in the wrong site to begin with. Mm -hmm. It was out in Bondurant where um, our radio facility was, radio tower and mm -hmm. transmitters were. And that is east of the city. And if you look at a topographical map of the city, there are ridges running north and south. So we blanketed, or we were shadowed in, in uh, lots of places in Des Moines, west Des Moines. Mm -hmm. was pretty well shadowed. We do, we're not getting a good signal in there. So to some degree, I think, Grant, that... Was it an engineering uh, problem? It was, it mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. uh, now we, we um, you know, eventually were able to build a 2,000-foot tower, uh, not without a couple of problems, though. And, and you may remember Ed Bream in Fort Dodge. Yes, who owned I do. A, a, a UHF station there, yeah. <coughs> which was also an NBC affiliate. And... Uh, Ed had in his contract with NBC that uh, no other NBC grade B signal was to get into his market, which meant we had to put a little 
you and our, our signal. Uh, so we didn't you know, get in there. Over the old uh, tower, that wasn't much of a problem. But mm -hmm. a new 2,000 foot tower at Alleman, that was, that was a critical problem. Big and, problem. And happily, um, uh, Bob Harder was able to make some arrangements where, where we uh, bought him out. That's the way. That's the way Ed went away. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Never was a very successful station. I no, think. but he. But he. He was a very interesting fellow. He was yeah, a, yeah. a lawyer yeah. and a, a politician, and uh, a longtime radio guy. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it was. A, that's one way you, to uh, to buy out your mm -hmm. competition. You. you uh, that was a pretty smart mm -hmm. move on mm -hmm. the part of uh, Harder. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about uh, Bob Harder a little bit. He. He was a. I did an interview with him, a hmm. person, a very nice man uh, and a very uh, ethical uh, businessman. Well, there, there was kind of a breed, I think, at that time, mm -hmm. Rand, and, and you knew them. Um, uh, certainly Bill Corton yeah. in Cedar Rapids, uh, McElroy, who I did not know him mm -hmm. well, uh, but uh, uh, Frank Fogarty, as we mentioned, and Johnny Gillen. Sioux City had uh, uh, John Sullivan. Yeah, uh, and some really just they were they were, they were professional broadcasters. Uh, very competitive. Very very competitive, but they were gentlemen. That's exactly one of the phrases I remember yeah. from Bob Harder's. Uh -huh. We were we were strong competitors, but we were friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and gentlemen, and they competed by trying to do the best job, not by trying to cut up somebody or or undercut them. Exactly. He was a he was a delight to work with. Um, I was, since he had been the, the sales manager, mm -hmm. I was concerned when I started and I told him, I said, you know, Bob, are you really going to be able to turn this over to me? I don't mm -hmm. want to just come and sit at the desk and do what uh, you did or you're, you, know, you want me to do or would have done if you'd stayed there. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, George, you, you are the sales manager. Well, to my chagrin, Right away, I found out uh, you know he wouldn't even tell me about where the skeletons were or <laughs> what was going on. And He's going to really. <laughs> I would say, Bob, you know, what, what, what about this kind? Mm. You better learn about that, mm -hmm. and which was fine. Mm -hmm. Which was fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, uh, he was truly my mentor throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had great regard, great respect for him, and enjoyed uh, his association in the office and, and out of the office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you were. Your ownership was this legendary Palmer organization mm -hmm, from mm -hmm, Davenport mm -hmm. that had the first radio station on the air That's in right. Iowa, WOC. That's right. Uh, what was your what was your experience as with corporate headquarters being in Davenport uh, and uh, their now their big television station here in Des Moines? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I rather liked that. Approach or having mm -hmm. the corporate headquarters someplace else for mm -hmm. obvious reasons, mm -hmm. but uh, very warm relations. Um, Dave Palmer was at that time the uh, principal. Uh, he was a delightful gentleman. Uh, he subsequently had a stroke, and was not able to um, to get around so much. But he was. Dave had a had a uh, philosophy that uh, uh, everything should be first class. Uh, everything that uh, we had in our facilities, as well as, uh, uh, and I certainly enjoyed this, our travel. Mm -hmm. We were to fly first class. We were to stay in first class play, uh, hotels. We were to pick up the checks wherever, which I got in some rather bad habits from that because, you know, sometimes <laughs> I wasn't traveling for the company. I would be kind of carried away with, with doing that. <laughs> you just became but, a reflex. <laughs> but he was a very classy fellow, mm -hmm. and, and then... Uh, after he had his stroke, and uh, and primarily then after he passed away, Bob Harder, well, Bob Harder really kind of took over uh, as president of the Palmer mm -hmm. uh, while Dave was still alive. Uh, and the the uh, Dave had three daughters uh, who were just very attractive, bright young women, uh, who also then became, you know, actively interested in in, in the station mm -hmm. and caring about it. Mm -hmm. So, but by and large, you you felt that the corporate station relationship was a pretty healthy one, and you. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yes, and I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I think unlike now, uh, where most, if not all, television, radio, and television stations are owned by some corporation that also owns uh, all sorts of other sorts of companies. Yeah. 
Uh, this was a broadcasting company. They yeah. understood broadcasting. That was what they wanted to concentrate on. And uh, that, I think, made it a, a very special uh, spot to be in. Right. right. And, of course, again, that with the WHO radio <coughs> was a, just a powerful institution that preceded the television station. Yes, absolutely. A statewide yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, medium. With, with, you know, lots of personalities there who, who went on to other um, uh, great things. You know, the sports announcer named Dutch Reagan. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and again, some of the great names that also participated in television. You mentioned Shelley, who is mm -hmm. the l term legendary, yeah. al always yeah. precedes yeah. his name wherever it's used. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a really, really fine journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then alongside him, you had a, a person, a guy named Herb Plambeck, who was yes. quite a, yes. an interesting personality. Yes, he was, uh, the farm director. Uh, and he too, like, like Jack and, and uh, uh, others uh, during World War II, was a correspondent. Yes. Mm. And went off to various parts of the battle areas and, and uh, reported you know, back some just outstanding. One of the few uh, stations yeah. any place in the country yeah. that did that. I had, just speaking of those two, Dutch Reagan and, um, and Herb Planbeck, uh, Herb was in my office one day and it was shortly after uh, uh, Dutch Reagan was now President Reagan, mm -hmm. and he had he had been in Des Moines uh, the previous week for for some sort of an affair. And we had put uh, it was some flowers or fruit basket or whatever in his hotel room. Mm -hmm. Well, while Herb and I were talking, and I I always like to answer my own phone instead mm -hmm. of having it weeded out through a secretary and finding out who it was and whatever. Mm -hmm. I just soon get right into it. Mm -hmm. So if my door was open, I always took my calls. So if I had somebody in there, I'd close the door, and my secretary would take them. Well, mm -hmm. my secretary knocked on the door, and she said, there's a gentleman on the phone who says he's Ronnie Reagan, <laughs> and I think it is. <laughs> so I grabbed the phone, and uh, it was President Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, next thing I noticed, I was standing up. <laughs> I had, had attention behind my desk. And uh, Herb got understood that uh, that was who I was talking to, mm -hmm. and Herb was trying to pull the phone away from me. <laughs> and finally, I said, Mr. President, I have one of your former colleagues uh, here in my office, uh, Herb Planbeck, would you like to talk to him? Oh, I want to talk to Herb. <laughs> so the two of them got on the phone and, oh, and what a, chatted what a, for a while. What a great story. But that was quite a treat. Yeah, I should say so. All the time I had to wonder, the President of the United States has got to have more to do, <laughs> more important things to do than to call George Carpenter in Des Moines, Iowa, <laughs> thank him for some flowers or some fruit basket. Well, but again, very that, touching. that's obviously one of the ways that he built <laughs> that right. powerful yes, constituency he that he had. He sure did. Yeah, he was. Uh, well, that's a, then you also had a who, person who has to be one of the great m media personalities ever to practice in Iowa, a guy named Jim Zavel. Yes, Jim definitely was. In, in all areas, mm. or, or, or he, he um, uh, obviously was, was known for his sports, particularly University of Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but Jim also uh, Jim did radio and and television sports. Yeah. Uh, very highly thought of. Uh, Jim also at one time, well, I mentioned that he'd been our, our the anchor sometime before I got there mm -hmm. on ten o'clock news. But we put Jim on a um, on a talk show, uh, and he was sensational. He was so well informed about so many different topics without ever preparing himself yeah. for it. He could just walk on and, and handle it. And that was just, uh, uh, you know, he was so used to uh, ad living that it was not uh, strange to him to do it that way. Not a bit. And but it doesn't uh, work in television because nobody else knows what you're going to say no. if you don't uh, have that script the, uh, laid out. Another Jim Zobel story, though, yeah. if, if we got time. Oh, absolutely. Um, when Bob Harder hired me as sales manager, hmm. he said, well, now, George, you know, your reputation sales is, is pretty good. Hmm. But I'm not going to be convinced until you get Zobel to pick up a check. <laughs> well, Zobel was re renowned to be uh, very tight. So I understand. <laughs> and, and it was probably a couple of years later, um, he and I were down at the University of Iowa, and there was a new football coach hmm. that we were uh, courting. 
uh, to work out some programs with Beat the Bear and, and some things we had on television. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, we had lunch at the athletic club. And Zabel assumed I was a member. Well, I wasn't. Yeah. He was a member. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, when the check came, I you know, told Jim, I said, I'm not a member. <laughs> so Jim kind of looked around, and, and whoever the coach was, you know, <laughs> was just getting a little embarrassed. And so Jim signed this <laughs> check. And uh, afterwards, we got in the car and got about 20 miles out of Iowa Sydney, uh, City, and suddenly he, was, he went white, and he pulled the car over to the curb, and I thought he had had a, a, a heart attack. <laughs> he reached around, trying to get that receipt, found that the check he had signed, the bill he had signed, was actually for a party that was taking place down the hallway that had about 100 people in it. <laughs> it, was, it was much more than than for just the three people. <laughs> but anyway, Bob Harder loved that. No. <laughs> so I finally got him to sign a check. No wonder Jim went white. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. He, that was a pretty cold bath for him. Absolutely. With his reputation. Yeah. Uh, oh, I've heard that many times, but that's mm -hmm. a great mm -hmm. anecdote. But it's a good test, a good, good sales <laughs> test. I, it certainly was. Very, very slick maneuver, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Carpenter. Uh, <clears throat> Well, Lee, uh, so now your career is moving into broader responsibility and you become the, the manager of the television station. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, and then from there to, uh, to the manager of the Palmer uh, media properties in Des Moines, including right. two yeah. radio stations. Yeah. Yeah. So you sort of bring uh, radio under the entire operation mm -hmm. under one management. Was, was, did that present it, some difficulties? Or? Well, it, it, it was always a challenge because it was, a, it was such an a, a icon in its own right. And, mm -hmm. and um, the people working on the radio side um, were very protective mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Uh, Abe Barron, and I'm not sure whether you knew Abe, uh, but Abe also was a former news news person. Uh, the manager uh, of the radio station. Yeah, right. And, and before that, he had done. He managed the uh, was the AP or the IN offices or whatever in Des Moines. But uh -huh. a, a very very good AP journalist. Probably, yeah. Very good journalist. Uh, Abe was the sales manager and then the general manager of the radio station, and, mm -hmm. and uh, then he left at the time that I, I uh, well, I guess. Shortly after I, I took over, yeah. But it was it was uh, it was a challenge uh, operating the radio station at that particular time because mm -hmm. it's fifty thousand watts clear channel, yeah. And the advertising market uh, was becoming a lot more sophisticated right. at that time, uh, particularly the uh, the national advertising. They really weren't interested in buying all the areas that that WHO radio uh, uh, covered. They wanted the area that it covered in the uh, in the uh, Arbitrons and the, mm -hmm. and the other stations. Right. So uh, it was a, it was it was a hard sell. It was an interesting one for me to get into. It also was a period in which there was a radical shift taking place in radio programming, as television pretty put a lot of radio stations pretty much out of business. Absolutely. So they switched over to music uh, music format programming. That's right. And that was the difficult, would, and it was WHO didn't join that bandwagon any Well, we had, we, you know, we had two options on that. We had an FM station yeah. uh, that had a good signal, and uh, so we turned that into our music station mm -hmm. and, and uh, turned in the uh, radio station into news talk, sports, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was, was probably the way to go. Yeah. And we had you know, lots, lots of talk shows at the time, so we started with those. Mm -hmm. Uh, now the you know the complaint is they're all conservative. At the time then, it would, the complaint against us was they all were considered uh, too liberal. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was very interesting. But it was a very important and a pretty difficult transition for a station with the coverage pattern that WHO had mm -hmm. and the history and tradition that it had. At that time, too, Grant, we. Uh, when Jack Shelley had been there and, and, and Bob Wilbanks following him, mm -hmm. the, uh, the two news departments were combined. Mm -hmm. And Jack was news director for both. Right. Bob Wilbanks was too. Yeah. Um, and I hired a fellow by the name of Jack Cafferty, yeah. uh, who uh, came up from Kansas City. And uh, Jack, Jack had a lot of enthusiasm, uh, a lot of neat ideas. Uh, and he 
brought to my attention the fact that really you need two separate news departments. And so I said, okay, you be news director of television and we'll put Bob you know, with the radio. And Jack did, Jack did a great job. Uh, I think we probably came as close then to, uh, to beating our friends at eight as, as we ever did. Uh, but as you know, at that time, my, my philosophy in hiring news people, and I think it might have been wrong, but was to hire the very best you could, uh, uh, knowing that they probably, if they're that good, they're going to get snatched up and taken away. And Jack, Jack got taken to um, uh, in WNBC. And in New York City, yeah. number one market. That's right. Uh, in the country. And you could say, and I was very, very proud uh, that he had. Right. But he was both, he was on the air too, wasn't he? Oh, yes, yeah, that's well, right. He's a very powerful yes, that's right. air person. Yeah. Well, it's a, you were a pretty good uh, judge of uh, horse flesh there, I'd <laughs> say. Yeah. He went on to great success, in, uh, and uh, now I enjoy him every morning on that uh, uh, CNN morning. Yeah, news, and uh, he's Jack, Jack's he a really survivor. He really some flavor to that, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He has that same kind of you know, cynicism that, uh, yeah. that he had that, that went over very well here. Yeah. He, um, his idea, you know, it worked very well, to, you know, to try and break up this, this monopoly that Aid had, we, right. uh, and to get Jack introduced in the market, yeah. we did a series called Cafferty Is. Mm -hmm. And Cafferty would be a train driver, and we'd get him down on the railroad groups, and he'd be up in the cab, you know, blowing the whistle mm -hmm. and pushing mm -hmm. the levers, and Cafferty would be a, a you know, high steel walker. We'd get him up in the buildings and doing that. Uh, but it worked. It worked very well. You had to do some high-powered promotion to try to to break the pattern on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at that time, speaking of high-powered promotion, the, uh, the in the I'd say late seventies, very early eighties, I felt the people that really had put their act together was WI mm -hmm. uh, up in Ames. Mm -hmm. They had, I thought, an awfully good on-the-air team. It was hard news, and they covered it well, and they presented it well. Yeah. The problem is they had no audience. Yeah, they just never had, and, and, never could break that. And what they needed was a really strong promotion stunt to yeah. get it. Mm -hmm. and, and at about that time, uh, some stations around the country, Omaha included, had uh, gone into helicopters, mm -hmm. which was purely just a promotional yeah. thing, but a very, very expensive one. And I thought, boy, if I was WI, that's exactly what I would do, because they could just, you know, knock the socks off everybody about their, their helicopter, and people would tune in to watch. And once they watched, yeah, I thought they would probably like like the product. Mm -hmm. So every time I'd see a helicopter fly over, <laughs> I'd take a close look to see if there was a Channel Five on it, because <laughs> right. uh, I knew if they got if they had one, we'd have to get one as yeah. as, uh, yeah. as would eight. But they were at such a disadvantage of being uh, remembered as the Ames station. They were the first station on the air yep. in Iowa, but it was in Ames, not in Des Moines. Mm -hmm. They had a good signal down here, mm -hmm. I guess, didn't they? And uh, well, that's a very interesting observation, uh, uh, George. Uh, now we're getting into the 80s, and um, there is a uh, there's a guy up in Waterloo by the name of Bill Bolster. Bill Bolster, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, who was your uh, NBC uh, station mm -hmm. manager colleague and yeah. uh, and a very interesting guy? Absolutely, uh, always Absolutely. pretty shy, quiet. But, oh yes, uh, very, yeah. real, very. No, much I so. I enjoyed Bill very mm -hmm. much. We worked uh, together, kind of putting together the uh, uh, Iowa Television Network. We've right. been doing some University of Iowa basketball games, and we would you know kind of set up ad hoc. Um, um, Stations to, so we could cover the state, right? And KWWL was always you know, an important player in that. And then Bill uh, was able to take it a step further when when uh, some contracts opened up at, at the University of Iowa and was able to get the uh, production contract right. for the, for their their uh, telecast. Yeah, and that's when we kind of formalized the uh, the network. And you put together then a combination of stations that created a statewide market mm -hmm. in Iowa. Yeah, we had WC in Davenport and uh, KWWL, WHO here, and then we had uh, uh, Bill Turner's station, I believe. In Sioux City. In Sioux City, right. yeah, I believe we had Bill. And then the Mason City station, which yeah. was the only yeah. uh, yeah. non-NBC right. affiliate. Right. And at times, no. we, at times we used uh, WOW in Omaha. Okay. I didn't remember that. Uh, on, on some special games that uh, uh, uh -huh. 
No, here they uh, they had KTIV in Sioux City. That was that, that, that was, was it. That yes, was the Black Hawk station. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. right. Right. It was the. It was also an NBC yeah. station. You had some incredible ratings on those broadcasts. That is the network did. Mm -hmm. And uh, and good sales. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Thompson, who was our my sales manager at the time, uh, was very sports minded. Very he he had started out as uh, as Zabel's uh, sidekick on, uh -huh. on radio, and uh, then then uh, Tommy knew all the sports people, and he was able to in, you know, sell sports better than anybody I've, I've ever known. Yeah. But well, it was a it was a good a good operation at the time, and it was a, a niche uh, that hadn't been filled. And Bill could see that right away. Bill, yeah. is, as you know, is a mm -hmm. very a visionary person. He was and has gone on to great success. Uh, yes, since he has. Then, of yeah. course. Yeah. Interesting guy to, to uh, have worked mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. So now um, we're moving into an era where there's uh, there are some changes uh, uh, in which you uh, are n are no longer associated with uh, WHO and and. You did, however, uh, uh, you you were moved into a corporate position with the Palmer uh, with the Palmer uh, Corporation. Yes, uh, when Bob Harder retired, mm -hmm. and they had a new corporate corporate head. Uh, they were planning to do some acquisitions, and because of my background, interest, my uh, uh, I went into that, enjoyed that for about a year. But I really, I really missed the uh, the nuts and bolts of, of uh, television, mm -hmm. of running a station. Uh, and happily for me at that time, the um, fellow who was the executive director of, of uh, uh, Iowa Public Television Network had left, and, and there was an opening. And frankly, the timing for me, Grant, uh, for my outlook on television, my philosophy on television, could have been better. Because as you're well aware, television had changed tremendously by that time. Tremendously. Uh, many stations were no longer owned by... Uh, Corporations that were broadcasting corporations, they were downstream uh, companies from big, big multiple ownerships. And the emphasis was quite different. Uh, and of course, the, the, whole wor the whole media world was getting far more, more complicated right. and competitive. Uh, satellite, uh, uh, the independent stations that were coming up around the country, uh, cable. Cable network. Uh, very definitely. And, and uh, I was. I was having trouble with things that we were putting on our own air uh, at WHO. As a matter of fact, when uh, when the uh, uh, prime access rule came about, so that all six three to seven programs were available for local stations yeah. to program, I didn't want to put on to you know to tell the truth or these syndicated game shows. I thought here's an opportunity that we should be doing something uh, uh, doing local program. local right. And so we did do, uh, uh, we got into the PM magazine syndicate, mm -hmm. which was, was kind of a fun thing. Uh, you produced some local material, and mm -hmm. other stations around the country produced local material and kind of sandwiched them together. Yeah. And you had your own local personalities. And, and they did not as well as MASH in the ratings, but they did great sales. Yeah. Wise. And I, I, that was more where I was at. Mm -hmm. And so my... My, when I was able to go to public television, I really found myself very much at home and comfortable with the, uh, the programming and the, the, uh, the focus that they, that they had. At Iowa Public Television, there are a, a number <coughs> of uh, statewide networks, but um, I doubt there are very many that started out as well, it didn't really start out that way. It started out as a De Mo as a offshoot of the Des Moines uh, School District. That's right, television. exactly. That would have been before your time. And, it uh, was, yeah. but I, I was at WHO at the time. Uh -huh. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, to be truthful, I was watching it very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, I had had a chance to meet John Montgomery, who was the inspirational leader at, w at, at the Iowa Public Television mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, he had the smarts to... To put together then a statewide network of, mm -hmm. of you know eight transmitters around the the, the uh, From state one. and 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 eight more translators, and and uh, uh, have it all centralized out of out of Des Moines. Right. 
and, and had strong backing from the state legislature, uh, strong backing from the education, educational com community. And I was getting a little concerned with John at the time because you know, they were running some movies and they mm -hmm. were running some wrestling programs. I'm thinking, wait a minute, this, you know, this really isn't educational. Mm -hmm. Well, I could, having then taken over his position, I couldn't have been more pleased and fortunate that he had done what, what, what he had done. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was quite a guy. Uh, and it, 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 uh, it was quite a change in, in, in many ways. Well, I'm sure it was. The focus is entirely different, uh, but you still had to, uh, you still had to manage a, a pretty complex operation which had different oh, yes. Absolutely. Uh, programming objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, uh, I, I had a visit with uh, my predecessor before I, before I applied for the job, mm -hmm. Larry Patton. And Larry at the time was with uh, Clark McLeod. Mm -hmm. uh, and Larry gave me two piece of advice that I, I kind of laughed off at the time, but it turned out he was pretty close. One was, uh, if you think it's a broadcasting job, George, it's not. Uh, and he said, secondly, if you do it right, you do what has to be done, you won't stay in the job more than five years. <laughs> because there's so many constituencies yeah. uh, that uh, you have to uh, deal with and please. The legislature being a very important one, right. uh, as well as uh, you know, all, the, all the, the, the friends groups and, and the foundation groups. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was very, very good, very interesting advice. And it's it's been a an entity that has produced a lot of uh, uh, quality programming. It, it has, and, and you know one of the things that, of course, I didn't when I started with public television. I really didn't understand the different arrangements of public television. Yeah. Where this was a state-owned, I guess they, I thought they were all that way. Well, there are maybe eighteen in the country yeah. like ours. Others are are community-owned, mm -hmm. such as New York and Kansas City and. San Francisco and, and you know, many, many Chicago big markets, uh, and some are owned by uh, by universities or, or academic groups. But uh, the state-owned ones are the ones who, who um, one, are getting much better financial funding from from um, from their states, and they have a much more of an educational commitment. Uh, the others are really operating, I thought, pretty close to their commercial brethren uh, mm -hmm. with their fundraising and, and with things they're putting on the air. They mm -hmm. were gearing themselves to trying to go after bigger audiences uh, as opposed to, I always felt that, that our, our mission uh, was to go after the many different audiences, mm -hmm. to put programming on that would not get a big audience in one program, but have to appeal to every, so many different interests. Right. And that, that uh, as we would say at the time, that, that uh, you know, commercial television uh, was bringing uh, people to advertisers, and public television was bringing uh, programs to people. Mm -hmm. And I think it worked out very pretty much that way. All the way from uh, Lawrence Welk to Masterpiece yeah. Theater. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. To high school wrestling and yeah. uh, college wrestling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then basketball. distinguished programs uh, such as Market to Market, which mm -hmm. was uh, originated yeah. on uh, Iowa Public Television. That's right. Longest, uh, longest running uh, agricultural show in the country. Yeah. And it's, it's syndicated, it's, it's uh, carried you know, throughout, the, throughout the country. Right. And the young man who produced that for many years now uh, sits in the chair that you occupied. And I assume that you have a fairly high regard as I do. Oh, Dan Miller? Dan Miller. Oh, yeah. my heavens. Hmm. He, he, you know, led me by the hand, uh, huh. taking me through all the minefields uh, when I first got in public television. Uh -huh. you know, I, was, I was not as sensitive as, as perhaps I should have been to, first of all, the most important thing for public television and for our public television was it had to maintain its credibility. And to do that, you had to make sure that your funding sources had no influence over the content of your programming. Right. And uh, happily, during the time I was there, there were you know, really just kind of minor challenges in, in that regard. But it was always out there. It yeah. was always something you had to mm -hmm. worry about. Mm -hmm. You had to worry about it with, uh, at one time, just before I came there, with the, uh, with the Friends of Iowa Public Television, who raised big dollars, and, but also thought, well, gee, you know, we ought to have something to say about, uh, about the programs. Yeah. You know? Can't do that. 
Yeah. Uh, we had some problems, not serious ones, it turned out, with the uh, uh, legislative and governor's staff uh, about things they thought we should be doing uh, because uh, we, were, we were a state agency. And I, I had to really make sure that... Tough job that, to stand in the door on that yeah, one. Yeah, right. it, it, it was. Right. Uh, but but, but was again, with Dan, Dan was the one who really brought that through to me. Mm -hmm. Delightful guy, smart guy. He, it's, yeah. it's a great benefit to public broadcasting that he is, he is doing what he's doing right he's now. He's in the position that mm -hmm. he's in, right. Well, it's nice to hear you speak that uh, affirmatively oh, about right. him. And, yeah. But it, uh, and again, we're at a period right now as we speak doing this interview mm -hmm. where there is pretty much of a frontal attack uh, from yes, Washington uh, on, uh, on public broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. going to be pretty tough, I think, in, in, the, uh, in the years ahead. And it will have to. Well, you know, the, the, that whole issue, again, of credibility. Yeah. And if, if there's any taint of government in, uh, intrusion, then you lose the credibility. Exactly. And, you know, uh, already people, you know, talk about biases on, on public television or public radio, which, which uh, uh, you have to be very concerned about. But you can't, the biases in programming are uh, to a considerable extent subjective. They're, of course they are, of course they are. Uh, yeah. But the bias that could take place if it, if it lands uh, with the Corporation for mm -hmm. Public Broadcasting, if yeah. it does land there, is another thing, mm -hmm. and because that's where the political pressure can be applied. But uh, you know, speaking of pressure, uh, this issue also came up before I retired, a couple of years before I retired, maybe 1990 or so, uh, where there was a, there were a group of, of um, legislators uh, who were unhappy with public television. They wanted more control over it, mm -hmm. and they, they were going to cut the funding at that time. And we rallied uh, our viewers mm -hmm. around the country, yeah. particularly in Iowa. And and uh, boy, and when I talked to uh, uh, Senator Harkin and Grassley and, and those others who were there at the time, they were overwhelmed with yeah. with the uh, uh, replies from these people about don't 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 do it, don't touch, don't touch yeah. this. This is what we want. Right. So I would expect the same thing's going to happen again, but it's... Well, I hope so, because I think it's going to take it, probably, mm -hmm. in order for public television to... Uh, public broadcasting uh, right. to... Well, I noticed the, the Des Moines Register had a... Duffy had a, a cartoon yesterday uh, uh, on that subject, which yes, I was glad to see. Yeah, right. Well, it, um, you certainly had uh, an interesting... Uh, mosaic uh, of experience, uh, George, <laughs> uh, in sales and in managing this medium of television as it became uh, such a powerful uh, influence in, uh, in society. Well, it did change an awful lot yeah. during, during that time. Um, I felt very fortunate and there was no, no pre-described plan that I would, be, would stay in Iowa. It just happened to work out that yeah. way and it's very fortunate for me but it, but the whole industry changed so much, uh, particularly in your area, in the news yeah, area. Right. Uh, I remember when I was a salesman, uh, news departments really were to go out and cover ribbon cuttings for my clients. You know, that's all I cared about. <laughs> was, and and, and that, unfortunately, I think that was they were treated that way in many cases. Mm -hmm. uh, then it changed totally in the '70s, uh, whereas you know you might have had a, you know four or five or six person news department, they began expanding rapidly. Yeah, right. And we were all in competition for, uh, for good people. And, it, uh, and, and uh, they were all young. Uh, all of them had watched uh, the investigative reporting that took place with Woodward and Bernstein, yeah. and they all wanted to, to do that. <laughs> uh, I found myself truly in probably the last six or eight years I was at WHO, spending the majority of my time uh, with news, news-related uh, activities. Right. Well, again, I think it's generally true that it is the most important, uh, it is the mm -hmm. most important programming mm -hmm. on a local station and produces, in, on an average, mm -hmm. about half, half of the revenue. So No question, but, it, but also, to me, it 
required the greatest responsibility. Yes. And this used to worry me when, you know, particularly we're hiring young people yeah. who had the best of intent, mm -hmm. but they still didn't know whether it was, you know, Madrid or, or Madrid, Iowa. Yeah. Uh, and they had <laughs> lots of things to learn. Lots of things to learn. And, and I too often found stories on our air of, of uh, activities that I knew very well, some I was, was involved in through mm -hmm. civic groups, mm -hmm. uh, that were just not reported accurately. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I started spending so much time, you know, concerned about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's the, the responsibility of, of saying something about a person or their company or whatever, yeah. uh, it lives with that person forever. And you, if you make a mistake, you can't just you put on something afterwards and say you're you sorry. do not get any of those back. No, uh-uh. <laughs> and it's pretty hard to fix them when you try to. And I think that was one of the big differences I found in, in uh, commercial broadcasting to, to uh, public television. Uh, same sorts of talents, except we didn't have a news department. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we did not have that continual turnover, which, which you had in, in television news, certainly in those days. Right. Uh, and matter of fact, the, the public television, we had hardly any turnover mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I found that the people at public television, the staff, were tremendously committed mm -hmm. to the product. Right. Now, a big difference in that, that you know, they had quality product to put on, they made it, but they had time yeah. to do it. Mm -hmm. And they had the resources. Yeah. To do it, whereas in, in commercial television, you know, we, we just didn't have that. Uh, we you know hammered things out and got it on the air and right and went on to the next project. The move uh, <coughs> out to the Johnston location had taken place then before you. No, no, I, I you, um, did. You manage that? Yeah, and and uh, that was a very uh, uh, just a, an excellent uh, decision, it seems to me. Well, I I. I the decision had been made yeah. before I got there, mm -hmm. and I think one of the reasons that, that I was hired be, was because when I had uh, been involved in the WHO building, yeah. the Palmer building, as well as I had been involved in a lot of um, fundraising. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting results of, of uh, those two buildings, which was dramatically presented to me when we made the move to the public television facility, when we moved to the WHO building, building from the former Midtown roller rink. Yeah. Praise the boy, I used to, to yeah. roller skate down yeah. there. And as a matter of fact, late at night, I, when I was in my office, I still think I could hear the uh, roller blades going around and the whistle <laughs> blowing and mm. girls skate right and boys skate left. But yeah. uh, when we moved to the new building at uh, WHO, people were excited about it. They were happy about it. Mm -hmm. Fresh new thing, new, uh, new equipment and new desks and yeah. all of this. Really excited about mm -hmm. it. When we moved to the one at Public Television, I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand what was happening. I thought people should be jumping up and down. Mm -hmm. And I took Dan aside one day. I said, Dan, what is, what's going on here? And he said, well, the building cost us, I think, $5 million or so that we raised for it. Mm -hmm. state, only, state didn't give us any money for that. Mm -hmm. The only money we got was when we sold the old uh, Bell Avenue building. Mm -hmm. He said, the people here would would rather have stayed where we were and had that five million dollars to put into programming mm -hmm. and production. Mm -hmm. Now that mm -hmm. that really told me the sort of people I was working with. It did, yeah. right? Yeah. But I think from an efficiency standpoint, and uh, I mean that's uh, that's a wonderful uh, facility. Oh, it, it it is, and 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 one reason it is, and, and another big difference between that and the uh, the WHO building, uh, the corporate group. Uh, said they had a, a fellow, uh, an engineer, who had built a couple of stations before in the corporation, and uh, that he was going to put this thing together mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, he'll, he'll build us a wonderful building. Well, he did build us a wonderful building, particularly for engineering, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but it was a wonderful building. But at public television, the architects, Bizarre Dykes, they went through this, I forget, Shred, Shred, Whatever, sure, mm -hmm. whatever, process, where they met with everybody on our staff, okay, and had their input as to how your job relates to his, and his mm -hmm. does to his, and his to mine, and mine to you, and where we need to be positioned, what sort of spaces we really need to have, and and uh, you know the first the first uh, drawing that came up to be you know 
bigger than the principal building. <laughs> right. uh, but but they worked it down, mm -hmm. and it still it, it when when I took friends through there who were broadcasting friends of mine, they would say, "Wow, this this was built by broadcasters, wasn't it?" And it Function. was. It really was. Mm -hmm. It was well well planned and well laid yeah. out. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. The uh, kind of fun part about it, which I'll add on, the uh, the, the auditorium, uh, studio auditorium, mm -hmm. that was something they had penciled in mm -hmm. um, uh, on the plan that, you know, well, if we get more money than we need, then we'll, we'll build a studio auditorium. And when they uh, were first raising funds, we went to um, uh, Ellen Maytag, uh, Fred Maytag's widow, and we're trying to get some funds from her for, for the building. And she said, well, what is this you've got penciled in here? And we explained the, uh, the auditorium and how that was going to be used for musical events and political events and mm -hmm. whatever. She said, well, I like that. I'll take that. Wow. So before we had any money <laughs> raised for the building, we already had the auditorium, the studio <laughs> auditorium. <laughs> and that, that added a, a, an aspect to what we could do out there that oh, uh, did. made it interactive it. And, and it brought us involvement from uh, yeah. the community, the communities. That would have been very difficult to yeah. have without it, yeah. right? That's and, it. and we never would have had it if, yeah. if it hadn't been for that. But she, she liked the looks of that, though. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. <laughs> it's nice when you can write a check like that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, one of the one things that she had you know, anticipated was that we'd be doing a lot of opera and, and yeah. uh, symphonies and whatever hmm. and I had to let her know we were also going to be doing some country western <laughs> whatever but she was she was a marvelous woman of a great sport yeah, and uh, certainly a great benefactor well now you're on the uh, the public broadcasting Iowa public broadcasting board which is the well no I'm, I'm, I'm on the foundation board. the foundation yeah. right the foundation uh, right and no, I, I shouldn't be on the board itself remember I had I had concerns about being on the foundation board as a past uh, executive director, I felt that mm -hmm. could make it uncomfortable. Uh -huh. uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I declined to go on it until Dan was named executive director. Mm -hmm. If been somebody coming in or from, from some other place, I, I, I would not have gone on it because yeah. that wouldn't have been fair to them. But Dan and I had worked so well together, yeah. and, and I knew there was going to be no conflict, uh, no conflict with him. And again, that, uh, that foundation and that dimension of that citizen involvement is critically important mm -hmm. to, particularly to the uh, survival, I think, of uh, public uh, broadcasting, uh, because mm -hmm. the Iowa Network is a part of the, uh, of the churning that's going on yes, around is. the public broadcasting. Yes, it is, and, and has a you know, bigger and bigger leadership role you know, yeah. nationally in that, mm -hmm. and particularly with, with Dan at the helm now. Yeah. Well, it's a very live and useful organization, as you and I mm -hmm. both agree mm -hmm. on, I, I'm sure. Well, it's been a wonderful experience to uh, sort of relive some of your, uh, your contribution to broadcasting over these years, uh, uh, and it's been, one, it's been great. Well, it's been a great contribution for me, right. as, as it has to you. It, it's, uh, I, I'm glad I didn't do the business school or whatever else. <laughs> right. It, uh, <laughs> made a lot of good friends as well as... Uh, and if, if you had decided to take a deal in Hawaii, you might have become a <laughs> surfer or something. Well, that might have been. That <laughs> might have been. Got yeah. a big suntan. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. life does make some interesting choices for us, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, good luck to you for pursuing these sorts of uh, histories. Uh, 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 well, it's, it is a wonderful heritage, I think, uh, George, and that we need to... Uh, we need to have it available for the future generations. So I, 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 I don't do know think, and I'll bet you agree, that, that you and I are very fortunate to have been in it during that particular time. Oh, I'm so grateful for that. I am so grateful for it. Nice to hear you say that. Oh. Well, we'll conclude there then, and with many thanks to you for your hospitality here. Well, thank you and your colleagues for coming down. Mm.